All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Ezekiel chapter 29 and God against King Crocodile here. And God's going to oppose the pride of Egypt and her Pharaoh. We'll jump into the first three verses. Verse 1 In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him. And against all Egypt, speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt, O great monster who lies in the midst of his rivers, who has said, My river is my own, I have made it for myself. So the prophecy regarding Egypt came to Ezekiel before the fall of Jerusalem. At this time, there were still some in Judah and Jerusalem who hoped that Egypt was going to rescue them from the powerful Babylonians. And so chapter 29 is going to begin a four-chapter series of prophecies that are going to be held against Egypt. This was necessary because even though Egypt held Israel in slavery for 400 years, Israel also had an impulse to look to Egypt in times of crisis that predated their years of slavery, going all the way back to Abraham's earliest days in Canaan in Genesis 12. So Isaiah warned God's people, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help in Isaiah 31. Even in Jeremiah and Ezekiel's days, they still looked to Egypt for help instead of trusting God in his plan. So the date given in verse 1 is explicit. It was a year and two days after Nebuchadnezzar had invested, uh, invaded Jerusalem in uh, 2 Kings 25 and seven months before its destruction in 2 Kings 25. So Egypt had long been an enemy of the people of Israel, both as the place of their long slavery and as a constant temptation both spiritually and politically. Ezekiel was to set his face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, because God said, Behold, I am against you. And it may seem strange that an exiled prophet of little Israel thought he had the place to speak to great kingdoms like Egypt, yet Ezekiel represented the God of the whole earth. So the secular historian saw Israel dwarfed into insignificance by his mighty neighbors, the religious commentator, the prophet, saw the great powers held firmly in the hand of little Israel's mighty God. So although the prophet does not mention him by name, the pharaoh at the time was Hophra, who attacked Nebuchadnezzar in the spring of 588 BC. This forced the Babylonians to lift their siege of Jerusalem. And it's the same pharaoh mentioned in Jeremiah 44 verse 30. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'll give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies, and into the hand of those who seek his life. As I give Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy who sought his life. So God likened Egypt to one of the great co- crocodiles that lived in the Nile and other associated rivers. Um, the great monster is a, uh, in this instance, it's a crocodile, the ruler of the Nile. And so it's the figure of Pharaoh, whose princes also and people are fitly compared to lesser fishes and Egypt to waters. Um, Egyptian prayers encourage the Pharaoh to be a crocodile to his enemies. All right, so this was the proud boast of Egypt and her Pharaoh, right? My river is my own. I've made it for myself. They believed that the great Nile River belonged to them and was created by them. They refused to recognize and honor the God of Israel as the creator and owner of everything. And so the river Nile watered Egypt and makes it fruitful beyond credulity. Uh, The Nile was the source of Egypt's greatness and was in every way the secret of the wealth and power of that land and people. All right, verse 4 and 5, God's promise to capture Egypt and Pharaoh like a great crocodile. Verse 4. But I will put hooks in your jaws and cause the fish of your rivers to stick to your scales. And I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers and all the fish in your rivers will stick to your scales. I will leave you in the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. And you shall fall on the open field. You shall not be picked up or gathered. I have given you as food to the beast of the field and to the birds of the heavens. So speaking like a great hunter of crocodiles, Uh, God announced that he would stop, capture, and displace Egypt. They would be terribly disrupted as a crocodile pulled out of the Nile with a hook. And so the crocodile is normally caught with hooks in the jaws and then it's pulled onto dry land where it would be slaughtered. And that's the figure used in these verses. The crocodile god, Sebek, was very important to the Egyptians in the Nile Delta area. He was considered Egypt's protector 
and at times was identified with the solar deity Ray. So, for all his arrogant pretensions, the glorious god of the Nile was no match for Yahweh, or God, who's going to toy with him as a fisherman plays with his catch. <clears throat> so, their prosperity and sustenance would be greatly affected. It was a coming wilderness season for Egypt, as if a crocodile were taken from the river and cast into an open field. Pharaoh and Egypt would be disgraced, treated as something that others prey and feed upon. Uh, the great concern for burial and memorial among the pharaohs is evident from their still existing tombs. God promised their disgrace would be so great if it would, uh, that it would be as if they were not buried at all. Verse 6 and 7, God's going to glorify himself through his judgment of Egypt. Verse 6, Then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel, when they took hold of you with the hand. You broke and tore all their so shoulders. When they leaned on you, you broke and made all their backs quiver. So the coming judgment upon Egypt would show them that God, uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel, did in fact rule. Judah hoped to rely on Egypt's power to help them against the Babylonian Empire, but they were like a staff of reed to the house of Israel. Egypt was a target of God's judgment that could never help Judah, who was also appointed for God's judgment. And this is a clear reference to the half-hearted response of Pharaoh Hophra to Zedekiah's appeal for help. Little is known of this action except that it produced only a temporary lull in the siege of Jerusalem. But we can presume that it was little more than a token foray on the Egyptians' part. And the Egyptians kind of had a reputation for making promises and not keeping them in 2 Kings 18 and Isaiah 36. And it was a sin of the Jews to trust Egypt. It was Egypt's great sin to falsify promise with the Jews. And for this, God now punishes Egypt. Verse 8 through 12, the sword upon Egypt. Verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I will bring a sword upon you and cut you, cut off from you man and beast, and the land of Egypt shall become desolate and waste. Then they will know that I am the Lord, because he said, The river is mine, and I have made it. Indeed, therefore, I am against you and against your rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from Migdal to Syene, as far as the border of Ethiopia. Neither foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast pass through it, and it shall be uninhabited forty years. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and among the cities that are laid waste. Her city shall be desolate forty years, and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and disperse them throughout the countries. So God's judgment would come through the sword of warfare, and it would lay waste to both man and beast. This judgment would come because of Egypt's pride, especially as it focused on the Nile. And so, <clears throat> trap on the repetition of the river is mine and I've made it. So with this proud speech, he has twice twitted. Uh, the, e the Egyptians so trusted in the river Nile, it's like they needed no help from heaven. And so God promised that there would be great devastation to Egypt lasting 40 years. It would be a desolate nation and the cities are going to be laid waste. And so as the leaders and people of Judah would be conquered and scattered, so would the Egyptians. God promised to disperse them throughout the countries. Verse 13 through 16, a promise to restore Egypt. Verse 13, Yet, thus says the Lord God, at the end of forty years, I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered, and I will bring back the captives of Egypt and cause them to return to the land of Pathros, to the land of their origin, and there they shall be a lowly kingdom. It shall be the lowliest of kingdoms, and it shall never again exalt itself above the nations. For I will diminish them, so they will not rule over the nations any more. No longer shall it be the confidence of the house of Israel, but will remind them of their iniquity when they turn to follow them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God. So God promised mercy and restoration to Egypt. He would bring back the captives of Egypt, even though that they would be the lowliest of kingdoms, not reaching their previous height of empire and influence. So one reason why God would bring Egypt low and diminish them was so that Israel would no longer put their misplaced trust in Egypt. So this lowly diminished state of Egypt would remind them of their iniquity when they turned to follow them. Verse 17, 18, Nebuchadnezzar's lack of reward from the plunder of Tyre. Verse 17, 
And it came to pass in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon caused his army to labor strenuously against Tyre. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder rubbed raw. Yet neither he nor his army received wages from Tyre for the labor which they expended on it. So Ezekiel received this prophecy long after the one previously recorded in this chapter. 27th year, that is the captivity of Jeconiah, 15 years after the taking of Jerusalem. The preceding prophecy was delivered one year before the taking of Jerusalem. This is 16 years after, and it's supposed to be the last which this prophet wrote. And this is the latest of his dated prophecies, two years after the vision of chapters 40 through 48. And so, almost 17 years later than the previous oracle, and almost 16 years later than the next dated oracle in the book. So Nebuchadnezzar conducted a long siege against Tyre, one that was in the end not worth everything that he invested. So he, neither he nor his army received wages from Tyre. Right, the <clears throat> the fruit wasn't worth the squeeze or the juice. So the um, first century A.D. Jewish historian and apologist Josephus stated that the Babylonian siege of Tyre lasted for 13 years. Tyre consumed its treasures in its own defense or otherwise made them unavailable to the Babylonians. And according to secular histories, we don't know whether Tyre was captured by the Babylonian force or not, though a few years later, Babylonian officials were in residence in the city and Babylonian uh, suzerainty was acknowledged. And all that Ezekiel tells us is that the rewards of the siege were not commensurate with the effort involved. All right, verse 19 through 21. God's going to give Egypt as plunder to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take away her wealth, carry off her spoil, and remove her pillage. And that will be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, because they worked for me, says the Lord God. And that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth, and I will open your mouth to speak in their midst, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. So because the Babylonian king received so little from Tyre, God's going to give Nebuchadnezzar the wealth, spoil, and pillage of Egypt. And a uh, cuneiform text will refer to Nebuchadnezzar's 37th year in 568 BC when the king of Babylon marched against Egypt, that is, within three years of this prophecy. And so there's a real sense in which Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon worked for God as his instruments of judgment. It was completely within God's rights to reward these workers according to his will and custom. And as God allowed Egypt to be pillaged, he would restore strength to Israel. In all this work, God would reveal himself to Israel and the world. And Psalm 132 verse 17 also makes mention of the horn of the house of Israel. It says, There I will make a horn of David grow, and I'll prepare a lamp for my anointed. Yet the context here seems to be more the restoration of Israel than the emergence of the Messiah. So no Messiah or any other ruler came in Israel about 586 B.C. So the symbol must refer to the strength and encouragement that Israel was to receive when she observed God's faithfulness to execute his judgment on her enemy. So Egypt in accord with both these prophecies and the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. All right, that's Ezekiel chapter 29. Thank you for joining me.